And, and we're recording. Yay! All right. Are you okay? Did you die? Yep. Okay. My soul left my body. <laughs> Should um, we do our poses for our thumbnail now? Yeah. <gasps> it was so good. I loved it. <laughs> so that's mine. Just because <laughs> it was very warm. It was very warm. Okay. So my name is Sam. And my name is Mason. And you know it's good when you hear right Kong Kopini. Yay! Yeah. I don't know if that was the same because this time it sounded like you were behind me and usually I'm behind you. So I feel like we fucked this up again. Nope, we were perfectly on time. Okay. I'm it just gonna work, have to work for it. It works better if I wait for you to do it. Because you're okay. on the delay. Makes sense. So today we are talking about Life, Love on the Line, which we watched on Vicky. It is the legal place to watch it, but I'm sure there's plenty of not legal places to watch it as well. Um, but it is a Japanese boys love, which we haven't really done a lot of Japanese boys love. Have we ever? No, we've never done, except for Given. Given, but Given was an anime, so it's a little bit different. Yeah. So we've done... Um, Korean, because we did Where Your Eyes Linger. We did yeah. Taiwanese when we did Because of You. And we've done, of course, a, a host of Thai boys love. But this is our first dive into Japanese uh -huh. boys love. And I feel like we picked the perfect entry point because this is something I feel like anyone can watch. This is not yeah. one of those series where it's like, oh, you have to be 18 and up, or oh, mm -hmm. you have to be okay with a lot of skin shit. Like, this is really a general purpose story. Yeah. So, Man. shall <laughs> I? Also Who should do the synopsis? Should Pardon? be you? Or do you want to do the you. synopsis? Okay, well, I mean, the synopsis is very simple. Um, two young men with active imaginations meet walking along traffic lines in Japan. And they strike up a friendship, which turns into a romance. But as life proceeds, both of them have very expe different expectations about what their relationship should and could be, which leads to conflict. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like it's, it's, it's a very simple plot. This is not one of the, this is not Tharn type. There's not a bunch of twists no. and turns. You don't need a chart. You're not like, well, <laughs> he's connected to him through this and that. <laughs> No, no. Uh, it is very, it's very cut and dry, very straightforward. But what this drama has that you really don't see in a lot of Thai dramas, at least in my opinion, there is a deep well of emotional content to draw from for this series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is the one thing that stood out to me the most as I was watching, like, the acting and kind of the things that are left unsaid is so much louder in this right. show than it is in Thai BL. Mm -hmm. So Very I'm gonna let Mason tall. start with talking about his his feelings regarding this show. I almost have not a lot to say because I really, really liked it. I mean, it was really good. I thought the story was well done. It unfolds in a like a really beautiful progression. I watched it pretty much all in one go. Um, there's only four episodes. It's literally like a two hour movie if you watch it all together. Um, it might even be shorter than that, because, like, the first episode was about 20 minutes. Maybe. Mm. Yeah. It's a roughly two-hour movie yeah. altogether. Um, the acting was really good. Um, the cinema... This is the most well-shot voice love I think I've ever seen. It, like, every shot, I was like, oh, the lighting is really good. Or, like, the shot composition, like... The way that they framed the characters in doorways a lot of the time was very interesting. You could tell that like the director and cinematographer, they put a lot of thought into every cut, every camera move, every everything. Everything felt deliberate. Sometimes it was a little hammy, I will say. Um, like there's times where a character will say something and it's like, oh, this is a throwback to a line from episode two. But it's like, it's a short series, so you kind of remember anyways. And then they'll like really tell you like, this happened two episodes ago. And it's like, we didn't need that. Um, like sometimes it'll cut to a close up of the mouth and it's like, we didn't really need that. And then a flashback, we just needed either the flashback or the close up of the mouth. But overall, gorgeously shot, well staged, like chef's kiss, super good. I loved watching it. I love staring at it. Um, I love that the two boys, so, 
it sort of goes through, they start at 17, and I think it goes to when episode four ends when they're, when they're 40. Um, however, they do break up at one point, and it's interesting because they become friends and become lovers at kind of like sunset. Sunset's when the romance sort of begins. It's when they start to become friends. It's when they kind of meet for the first time. It's golden hour, the hour of romance. And then the moment that things start to switch really for Akira especially, because he's the one that breaks it off with Yuki, is, um, what was it? It was sunrise. So the romance ends, so the romance starts at sunset and ends at sunrise. I don't know, I just thought that was like a nice like, storytelling thing like it was never said but it was deliberate very deliberately shown i like the fact that this is not actually a boy's love in a lot of ways this is again kind of like how i felt about barn type this is a gay show because <laughs> they start as boys true enough but the fact that they end at 40 we're out of the kid phase for a lot of this show oh yeah the yeah, like the first episode, we're 17, and then when we begin the second episode, we're 19. But yeah, the last two episodes especially, it's all adult years. It's not at all any kid stuff. And so that was important. And then just the way that this show talks about expectations about life. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I found very real about this show, and I think that's the reason why me and Mason di disagreed about one character in the show. Um, so the character of Itu, he is very conservative. He lives a very kind of by the book life. You know, he goes to school, makes his grades, goes to university, gets a job as a salary man. And he doesn't really expect anything out of life other than just going to the day to day and going through the motions. And it's established very on in episode one that he gets that thinking from his mother. Yeah. Like, he lets him know right off the bat, like, your sister is a wild card going to school in Tokyo. You need to go to school at the university around here. You need to get a regular job. And she says you need a normal happiness, which I've never heard that phrase before. But after she said it, I could not stop thinking about that phrase. Mm. Um, but like, even when he's testing for getting out of school and she's like, you made really good grades for your testing. And he's like, no, they really weren't that good. And she's like, yeah, but you're going to go to a normal school. So that's good enough. And it's just, I found that to be something that as I was watching it, I could see why their relationship would fall apart because while Itu is a very by the book, normal, not expecting anything out of life. He's with somebody, Yuki, who is manic pixie dream boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's all about his imagination and being super spontaneous and not really living by anybody else's rules. And, you know, he expects that anything that you dream about, you could possibly have. And even his attempts at being normal, just don't work out for him because he's miserable. And the only real normal thing that he's ever done is be with his high school sweetheart. That's really it. Yeah. And so I think what happened to them was almost bound to happen because you've got one person with one expectation out of life and you've got somebody else with a different expectation out of life. And throughout their relationship, communicating what the other person wants has always been difficult. Like the very first yeah. kiss they had. Um, so the very first kiss they had, they're walking along the line and they're doing, they do this cute little dance that whenever they meet along the line, they hold each other's hands and dance to flip around so they can keep going. Mm -hmm. And on one of the times that they do that, um, Itu runs after Yuki and kisses him and then runs away. Mm -hmm. And he tries to avoid him the next day. And instead of, him being like, hey, why'd you kiss me? He's like, hey, did you know you ran off the line? You could have been killed. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't ever ask, how do you feel about me? Mm -hmm. Ichu just goes along with, oh, you're not mad that I kissed you? All right, we'll just keep kissing. Right. And when you've got two people that have different life views and different expectations out of life, communication is key. Mm -hmm. 
because you both have very fundamental misunderstandings about what's possible, what's not possible. And I think that's the reason why when the big reveal comes that E2 is gonna, you know, in the relationship because he feels like we can't keep doing this. This is kid stuff. This is fantasy stuff. Mm -hmm. Where Yuki, he's all about living his fantasy life. So his fantasies are very real to him. Mm -hmm. Even when they first meet at 17, his reactions to possibly getting eaten by sharks is a very real reaction, even though yeah. he recognizes it's fantasy, but it's real to him. Mm -hmm. And so to have somebody that you care about is kind of one of the most stable things in your life. And they tell you, oh, your entire belief system is just child's play mm -hmm. and it's time to get back to real life. I can't imagine how devastating that would be. So I found that to be a very interesting and real kind of conflict in the story. So even though a girl was introduced in the story, it wasn't necessarily the girl who split them up. No. It was, it was more of this reinforcement of this is the path I'm supposed to take. Right. That's what split them up. Right. Yeah. It was good. I want to give, I want to give a shout out to Honoka. I think is it Honoka her name? The yeah. wife. Honoka Shirishi, I think is her name. Yes. I want to give a shout out to you because you did the thing that you're supposed to do. You slapped him across his stinking lying face. And you said, <laughs> I'm gonna take all your money. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> absolutely you know because yeah. like she didn't she didn't gay bash him you know he told oh. her that they were divorcing because he was in love with another man mm -hmm. she didn't gay bash him instead she slapped him and said how dare you ruin all three of our lives yeah and i was like queen shit yeah she, i she's actually a very pitiful character because it, after he says that she goes oh, i can never just get what i want and you're like oh you like she's like portrayed as someone that, like, is a very hard worker and, like, kind and, like, she's never done anything, like, wrong in the series, you know? She's fairly never. respectable, you know? So you're like, oh, I kind of want her to have a win. So in the epilogue of the show, when she has, like, a husband and a child, it's like, okay, husband, child, we know she already had the career she wanted. So, okay, she wanted all of these things, now she has them, good for her. We love to see it. Again, queen shit. Yeah. And, you know, like, she liked him in high school, so mm -hmm. her meeting him again as an adult in the working world, of course, it feels like kismet, and you're mm -hmm. getting closer as, you know, work friends, and you're spending more time with him in work life than you ever spent with him in school, so you feel confident enough to say, I'd like to have a relationship with you. Right. And he could have ended both of their entanglements at that moment by saying, you know, I'm with someone. You don't have to say who, you say, I'm with someone. But instead, he basically looked at it as like, this is an easy out to the problem I have of living a normal life. I'm going to go ahead and utilize her feelings for me and crush somebody else and live a relationship that is a lie because it's normal. Right. So now let's talk about his mom and the showdown slash confrontation at his parents' house that kind of resolves his expectation of living a normal life mm -hmm. so when we were typing back and forth on twitter i was like give his e2's dad uh an award for best parent or add him to the good parent list and you were like well i think that um yuki's mother is a better parent now uh -huh. i will say this i very much agree that yuki's mother her response to her child's coming out is ideally what you want Mm hmm You know, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say I agree. I love that scene. Because Yuki's like, because they've been dating for 10 years plus at that point, you know? So it had been a minute. And, you know, he spent all of his adult life with this man living with him. And because mom like, hey, I've been seeing this man for, she, he didn't even say I've been living with him for 10 years. She just said, I'm seeing a man. Mm -hmm. And his mom goes, Ah, well, you can't get married here, but we can always go to Europe, and I've always wanted to go to Europe, so, eh. <laughs> yeah, she's like, and I can still have grandkids. They're letting people adopt, you know? She's, like, totally about it, which is what you want. Yeah. Um, whereas on Ichu's side, we begin his confrontation with his family by his mother literally not letting her daughter's fiancé in her house. Yes, because he's foreign. 
yes, he's a, when I was reading the caption, they said that he was speaking Urdu, mm-hmm. so he's either, like, Indian or Pakistani, perhaps. Right. Uh, and first of all, the amount of disrespect. If I was the daughter and my mother wouldn't let my fiance in her house, then we're leaving. Right. You know, like this, just flat out. But the daughter, I have to give her credit. She didn't step into her mother's house to beg for forgiveness or to ask her to please accept him. She just went there like, this is what it is. This is how I'm going to live my life. You can either take it or leave it, but I'm Mm -hmm. not going to let this man I love go. Yeah. And as the mother is talking to the daughter, the mother is like the worst. She's xenophobic. She's just, she's biased and just all the bad things, all the bad things. She's, she's bad to her daughter, which she has been hating her daughter since episode one. Mm -hmm. And every frustration she had with her daughter, every kind of bad feeling she ever had about who her daughter was and how her daughter lives her life comes out in that conversation. And while it's coming out, it is literally a replay of all of the hurtful things that Itu said to Yuki when they broke up. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like the light bulb goes off. Like, I've never lived a normal life because a normal life is what I wanted. I've always lived a normal life because it's what's been drilled into my subconscious is what I was supposed to do. Right. And once kind of seeing how hateful that rhetoric is when directed at somebody he loves, he realizes how hateful that rhetoric was when he directed it at somebody he loved. Mm -hmm. And then he just kind of blows up and lets his mom know, like, I'm getting a divorce. I was in love with a man. I lived with him for years. And I gave that up trying to be normal. And I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just Mm -hmm. not. And then his dad, as he's leaving the house, is like, live proudly. And on the one hand, it sucks that it took the dad this long to intervene, because while the mother was talking mad reckless to her daughter, the dad should have chimed in and said, okay, that's enough. You don't need to talk to our child like this. I get the feeling that over the years, the dad has kind of just left the mom to do the majority of the child rearing. He hasn't really been involved. Mm -hmm. And so to go against a pattern of behavior that's been going on at this point, at least 30 plus years, you know, that's hard to do for a lot of people. Some people are Mm -hmm. just better sticking with the status quo. And in that family, it looks like it's easier to stick with the status quo because that's what each has been doing for so long. Um, but you know, the dad is like, I'm not gonna let my family fall apart in this moment. It's either I speak now or I don't, I'm not gonna see either of my children ever again, more than likely. And so it is, it's brave to say that in that moment. And that's why I appreciated him as a parent. I, I'm not saying that he's a better parent than Yuki's mother. I think Yuki's mother is, like I said, ideally what you want, but the fact that Ichu's father didn't let the family fall apart in that moment. He spoke up so that there was a possibility for everybody to get together again, like in the ending credits. Mm -hmm. That's really important. Mm -hmm. I think the reason I didn't, like, I was kind of watered down by that is because you messaged me a few days before I had seen the episode and you were like, he's great. We need to add him to the best parents list. And that scene, I was like, I mean, good for him, but there's a better parent in this movie. Or in the show. So I was sort of like, oh, that's it? That's all we're going to get? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's not a bad parent, and I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> I was just sort of like, oh, I thought there would be more to this. Okay. Yeah, and I, I totally get where you're coming from. I was thinking about it more and more before we started talking, because like I said, I got off on a tangent when it came to this show that has nothing to do with the finer points of what other people want to talk about. But one of the things that comes across to me over and over again when we're watching shows from Thailand, Korea, Japan, everywhere, is that these are a lot of populations where the population is fairly homogenous. And with Japan especially, there's just such a long-running traditional culture in Japan. Like the idea of a salaryman, that is what everyone strives for is to right. be a salary man. And 
I didn't think about like why this normal thing would have such an impact on E2 until I started thinking about like, well, how would I act if everyone around me had the same desire? Mm -hmm. Because here in America, we have so many people that come from different backgrounds. They have different religions, different ethnicities. And so there really, there really isn't a normal in America. Like there's the American dream, but even that has changed over time. We don't have kind of a, an ideal or a way of life that we're all striving to achieve that's the same. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was more than just kind of even his mother, her running his subconscious and telling him this is what you need to do mm -hmm. it's everything else like there's a manga that was written the manga for this was written before this show was written and in the show he's constantly smoking cigarettes after he starts working mm -hmm. and the cigarettes are a part of salary man culture right. if you're a man you smoke and yuki doesn't smoke and it's all these little things it's buying the suit so you can work as a salary man. It's smoking the cigarettes because that's what salary men do. It's mm -hmm. staying out late and drinking because that's what salary men do. It's these things that eventually are harmful to your life and don't mm -hmm. contribute to your, to your livelihood in any positive way other than finance. But when everyone around you is promoting these same negative behaviors, what leap of faith does it take to just say, I'm not going to be a part of that anymore? And in that way, Yuki is not just a manic pixie dream boy. He's like a unicorn. Yeah. Because he's absolutely not anything that anyone around him expects. And he never even really tries. Like he does the attempt at the salaryman thing because school is over. It's time to do something. Mm -hmm. But even that, he gives up fairly quickly. And is like, I actually want to go back to school and become a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I guess... Like props to Akira for being like, yeah, go do that. Like without hesitation. Um, but that yeah. was the very first sign of, oh the normalcy that he expected isn't going to be there because he's like, I'm supportive of him, but at the same time, oh no, my normalcy bubble has been popped a little bit. You know, the air is eking out. Yeah. And it's just like, I just love the fact that this show not just con confronts these individual characters issues. It definitely in a lot of ways confronts society and like, why, why do we keep trying to reinforce normal? What does, <laughs> what has normal done for anybody? Right. And so I've just, I really appreciate that about this show. I, I just love the fact that like, if you are from Japan, there's probably a lot of depth to this that you would see that we're not catching. But right. even as an outsider, I could, I could still glean little glimpses and pieces of it watching it from our vantage point. And I just really appreciated that a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I really, really like this show. I really, I like this show way more than I thought I was going to. Because mm -hmm. it had a terrible promotional poster. The poster was trash. But <laughs> <laughs> it really did. And like both of us, well, I think both of us, I'm not sure. Did you read the manga? Because I did. I did not. I didn't know there was a manga. Oh, I thought I told you. Okay, so. Is it drawn this, well? That's my first question. Your definition of drawn well and mine of drawn well are very different, so I don't feel comfortable answering that. Mm. But I will send it to you because I literally thought I had sent it to you a couple of months ago, back when I first heard about this show, because I'm like, oh my God, Wayne is going to be in a show. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but, <laughs> but I saw the manga before I ever saw the show, and I read the manga, I would say probably a month before I watched the show, and the show is very true to the manga, like, like unerringly close. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing that I would say is that there are some additions. The, the confrontation with the family, the family is not even a part of the manga, so that's not an issue there. Um, the friends that he has in high school, which really play no part other than to say this is weird that he doesn't like this girl, uh -huh. they aren't in the manga. It's really mostly just those two. Like that, mm -hmm. They're really the, the main thing. And the high school confession, by Honoka that doesn't happen in the manga either it's a woman that he marries for sure but it's just they don't show the link between a high school confession and an older work confession right um but in the manga after they get together in Alaska they're together only for like another 25 years and then what 
uh, E2 dies. He dies Come of on. lung cancer. All the smoking. the smoking? Yeah. Okay. And so the end of the series is Yuki at home with like his home attendant and they're going through all of the books and things that he's written over the years and kind of his career as a screenwriter and a novelist and then she he's telling her like we get the reason why we have the story is because he's retelling about the love of his life and that's where it is like uh -huh. this the whole show is really a retelling of him talking about the love of his life to this uh -huh. home attendant that he has wow um, man which is why the at the very end of the manga when yuki dies he ends up in, on like this celestial line and ichu is waiting for him on the line for them mm. to like live the rest of eternity in the stars cute oh yeah so even though it does end with them being separated for a time you hope that their souls are joined together for eternity how cute yeah how cute. but yeah, reading the manga, I I was like, this is a cute story, but it's it's a little dry. Like, not bad, it's just a little dry. But once I saw it, I was like, oh, you've done such a good job converting this. I would have never thought manga, this is so great. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it, good for you. Good That's for you. Good, well, it definitely seems like they made necessary additions. Yeah, I mean, they did what it took to, to make it theatrical rather than on the page. Yeah. Yeah. I will All say, right. one of the things that I do wish is I almost want another episode. I don't know, I just, like, the epilogue was so sweet, and I was like, no, I want to I wanna go back. I want to see how this all plays out. Like, give me an episode where it jumps the cup, where, where it goes from, okay, they get back from Alaska, now what? You know? I want to see the mom come around. You know, I want to see, I want to see this play out more because you like the characters and you're like, okay, they won. I want to, I want to savor the moment a little bit more. Like we want to see their Swiss wedding because obviously they got married because they're both wearing rings when they're 40. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming that the Switzerland wedding happened. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would like to see that. And then like, when Itu saw Honoka with her husband and her baby, did mm -hmm. you notice he did this number like this? He started like crying. It was weird. Yeah. And so like, I felt like there, that's another conversation that maybe needed to be had is like, did they decide to have kids or not? Yeah. In the manga, they didn't have any kids. Yeah. I would like to see that. I would, okay, you know what part, this is like going way back and this just ran thought, you know what part really fucked me up? Where I was like, fuck you, Akira, die in a hole, is when he, <laughs> you, when he, so he breaks up with Yuki, and you're like, okay, he's probably going to date Shiraishi now. And then he walks into his home, and it's like the same replay of when he walked into the home for the very first time in the show with Yuki, and it's like, it's glowing, and it's, and it's different colors, and it's, you know, it's this very, like, surrealist filter on the camera, and it's her. And you're like, and... In Yuki's home, you brought Right! Her. I was thinking that too. I'm like, you oh. made him move out? <laughs> also, if you noticed, the color palette with Yuki in the house is very, very warm. Like when he opens the door and Yuki's there, it's a very, it's all warm tones. When he opens it up and she's there, cool tones. When they get divorced, cool tones. That scene is all, she's in like lavender, everything is like a baby blue, like cool tones, you know? Um, Anyways, just like the cinematography, super good. But um, yeah, I was Except like, in Alaska. How, how dare you? In Yuki's home, also, that apartment's trash. I would have fallen off by now. Because like the apartment had like a weird setup and there's like a whole last area where it's raised a good six to seven feet with no railing. And I'm like, I would have fallen off and died. <laughs> yeah. I'm assuming that E2 must make like some serious cash because that is a very huge apartment. Like it yeah. is at least three stories because there's the lower entrance where the kitchen and the dining room are. Then there's the middle like living room area. And then the bedroom is upstairs in like a loft area. Yeah. And housing in Japan is not cheap. So. Yeah. So he must be making great money. And then also like for what, a couple of years, Yuki didn't work because he was in school so that he could become a screenwriter. 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, he must have been pulling major bank. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about Alaska. Yeah, it was an okay scene. The best part was um, Wayne and I always forget the guy's name. See, Could you repeat that <laughs> clearer? <laughs> I love Choo Choo and Wayne. They're just, oh, okay. So it was spoiled for me. I, I wish that I didn't subscribe to so many different BL people, but it started with first Mason being like, oh my God. And then going to my timeline and just being spammed with images of Wayne and Choo Choo together. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about the actor Wayne Song and we're talking about Chun Chi, whose last name I cannot remember now, who were both in History 3, Make Our Days Count. They were the main characters, Hao Ting and Chi Gu. And I just love them. I very rarely actually remember character names, like unless the show is named after them. I have a really hard time with character names. Hao Ting and Chi Gu, I will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah. They're, <laughs> <laughs> they're very special. Yeah. But um, spoiler alert, at the end of History 3, Make Our Days Count, um, Shigo's character dies in a car accident. And it's kind of foreshadowed a little bit in the show, but also when we talk about Make Our Days Count, we'll, we'll explain why that was still a cop out and some bullshit. Um, so the very last episode of the show is literally Wayne, the actor, crying through about an hour's worth of film. Yeah. And there's a scene at the end of the film where he's like, I'm going to go up to a mountain and you don't really know what it means, but he's like, he has taken up this interest in mountain climbing because at one point, um, Hao Ting and Shigu had a conversation about how Shigu liked to be in high places because it made him feel closer to his parents who lived in the stars. And so them being in this show meeting in Alaska at the Aurora Borealis where the stars are literally dancing. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you couldn't have casted this or put them in a better position mm -hmm. if you tried. And mm -hmm. it just, it felt like, yes, this, this yeah. is, I, I have closure now. Mm -hmm. And like, no one knew that Chu Ching was gonna be there either. Like we knew Wang was gonna be there. And then when Wayne's scene came, you're like, oh, they show Wayne. You're like, oh, it's Wayne. I love Wayne. And then someone <laughs> runs up and I did not expect it to be him. And I was like, because I was watching it, like someone uploaded it like right after it aired on Twitter. And I was like, who's this man? And then they, he takes off his coat and it's a Chu Ching. And you're like, <laughs> this, is, this is my canon. This is what I'm going to believe is the ending of Make Our Days Count. It goes, Episodes one through nine, ten, obliterate it, cut to this episode, <laughs> cut to this scene. I mean, really? It's the epilogue. It's, <laughs> it's so perfect, and, like, they do, like, a little nose-nuzzling thing, and mm -hmm. then kind of hugged up. It's not extreme, but there's something about the way that Wayne looks at Chun Chi that mm -hmm. just... I wish, I wish anyone would look at me like that. Mm -hmm. Anyone at all. Because he mm -hmm. always looks at Chun Chi like, you hung the stars. I am your moon. I, re I revolve around you. Mm -hmm. And it is just, it's special, man. They, they've got to be the best boys love couple of all time. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a blessing to witness. Um, however, Alaska's got problems. That was a beautiful moment. We really uh -huh. appreciate that. I realize that that seemed like a pun because Alaska the drag queens also got problems. But uh, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big drag race fan, but even I didn't even think of that pun. <laughs> <laughs> so in Alaska, um, we have E2 there because he is, it's been years since he broke up with Yuki and he's walking down the street and sees this Fairbanks, Alaska, Aurora Borealis ad, and he remembers the time that Yuki's like, we should go there someday. So he just goes there. And surprise, surprise, kismet, meant to be, karma, destiny, there's Yuki. And he mm -hmm. chases down Yuki, and Yuki, like, roundhouse punches him, which he deserves. Yeah. Because, I mean, he put Yuki out of his home and broke up with him and just 
Yuki tried to do the whole gay bar scene, but it didn't work out for him. So, you know, as far as we know, Yuki's kind of been alone these last few years. Well, he says, and so, like, I spent all this time trying to get over you. This was my last ditch effort to get over you. And you're like, uh, Yuki, you deserve <laughs> so much in this world. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's such a unicorn. He's just, he's just, he's too pure. He's too pure. Um, so they're like fighting and it resolves itself probably in all of two to three minutes. And it feels very out of step with how long they were apart, both in yeah. years and in show length. Yeah. Because there's only four sections, and they spent pretty much the majority of episode four apart. Yeah. So for them to just, like, get together in two minutes, it didn't feel great. It felt like this is something where they should have shown you guys going on a series of dates or something to get back to the place where you're like, I I'm ready to try this again with you. Yeah. That's why I would have liked an episode five. We spend the first half, you know, Akira's building his, uh, or Yuki is gaining Akira's trust back. That's like the first half. And then the second half is like the bliss. You know, the families are all okay. We get the wedding scene, things like that. Yeah. Um, also, I am very upset because you were talking about how great the cinematography is, but when they finally have a kiss and the fucking hoods are in the way, I was so frustrated. I'm like, my God, I realize we're in Alaska and we're kissing in the snow, but could anybody just pin these hoods down a little bit so that the fur is not covering the whole time? Pin the hoods down, maybe God in a, a light. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we do need to see something. That was the one scene where I was like, all right, y'all really filmed on location and it was a bad idea, you know? They, yeah, and the camera quality was like super grainy. And I don't know if that's because they filmed on location and they couldn't do big lights or whatever, but like the quality of those Alaska scenes were very poor compared to the quality of the Japan scenes. Yeah. Also like there's still shots from their Alaska scenes where it's like the couple and they're with the Chinchi Wayne couple. And again, it's just night and day. The still photos versus the moving is just, it's crap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not best pleased. This is a very, very small note. I don't know if it bothered you, but it bothered me that they had the same haircuts for, like, their entire lives. Like, Yuki has the same haircut at 40 that he does at, at 17, and I'm like, please cut your hair. It's a, this is a bad haircut, man. That was the only haircut that bothered me. I didn't have any problem with Ichu's haircut. I thought it worked for him because, I mean, he he basically went from having bangs to having, like, the salary man do. So yeah. I, I wasn't too worried. But yeah. Yuki, that hair was a mess in high school. It was a mess at 40. It just, it was, it's a mess. I don't know what time frame where that hair works for anybody. No. I could he, see it. You know I, what his like, hair reminded me of? Go ahead. I was going to say, it worked in, I was like, I'm okay with it in high school because he's like a dumb high school kid, but like, Jesus Christ, you're an adult. <laughs> Cut your hair. <laughs> or at least comb it. You know, it can be long. You just got to do something. Like, I thought it was a wig, so I went to the Instagram of the actor, and he just has bad hair. Like, just straight up and down. His hair is always awful. Mm. And he's got a really tall forehead, too, so when he pulls his hair back, it looks even worse. But yeah, I just, I hated his hair. He looked like, he looked like he was wearing a darker version of an Andy Warhol wig. Mm. And I just could not stand it. And no. I, it never got better. It just got progressively worse. Like when he was in the gay bar getting hit on, his hair looked like a bird's nest. It was awful. Yeah. So the hair, the hair really did bother me as well. You were not the only one. Also, like, Yuki's school uniform was so cartoonishly bad. But the, I think that's how they're supposed to, I think that's how they actually look. The school uniform that Ichu has is much nicer. It's that kind of black, I don't know, kind yeah. of military-esque looking uniform, whereas Yuki's is like these wide-legged plaid pants with <laughs> like baby blue jacket it just it was so ugly i hated it it was I ugly it. but i think it fit the character 
I did think it was funny that like, I mean, I, I, I know why they kept the same actors, but I just thought it was funny that like, Akira's actor is like a grown ass man and he looks like a grown man. So when he's in this blue uniform, he's like, hello, I am boy. And you're like, no, sir. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hello, fellow young people. Yeah. <laughs> was, was, she was like, Will you go out with me? And I'm like, You are a grown woman with smile lines. Like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah. And they didn't do anything to try to make anybody look aged up either. Like, other than like changing where the hair is parted on Ichi's character, they didn't do anything to make him look like he has deeper wrinkles or anything like that, which mm -hmm. I could appreciate. Even the parents. The parents look the same from episode one to episode four. Mm -hmm. So I, I get that it was really more about internal growth than external right. aging. But yeah, I, I hated the hair. I, I hated the hair. hair something fierce. Also, hair's a really easy way to signify change of time. So yeah. that would have been easy for them to be like, like I could see Yuki being the type of guy that like, he's so into his own fantasy and he's super into like current trends with things that he's always changing his hair to fit like a current weird trend that's happening in Japanese fashion. Mm -hmm. so. But I think another part of that too, which I was thinking about it on hindsight is that we don't really know what year anything happens. I thought it was mo like close to modern time. But I don't know, it's it spans so long. We're, it's 23 years. And so oh. over the course of 23 years, we don't know necessarily when that 23 years began. So I think part of keeping the hair the way it did instead of trying to do trendy hair and trendy clothes is because they don't really want to pin themselves down to a timeline that matches with real events. Yeah, but some of them... I don't know, but they had like modern phones and computers, you know, like you had like a fucking normal ass like Samsung phone, you know, mm -hmm. so I think it was, I think the later parts were close to modern time. I think so. We just don't really know when. And I mean, even the later parts, he had a modern phone in when he was like, what, 36 maybe? Yeah. And it jumps forward four years. So I don't know if, if 40 is today and 36 was four years ago from today. My take is, and I have no backup for this is, the like when he's in like his mid to late 30s, mid, mid 30s, it's present day. And then the 40 is like years, is a couple years in advance. Yeah, so I think that they, Again, I think they were just trying to err on the side of like, let's not pin ourselves to a specific time because we don't want people being like, oh, that whatever appears in this scene is anachronistic. So I, I get that. Mm -hmm. I get that. We had a lot more to talk about for this show than what we both anticipated we would. This is oh, one more thing. One more person needs a shout out from the show. The sister. I thought Akira's sister was really cool. She followed the beat of her own drum. There's a scene in episode two where she sees her brother with Yuki and they're not, they didn't kiss or anything, but they were holding hands and they say goodbye. And it's a very like loving type of goodbye. Mm. And she's like, is that your partner? And he's like, fuck, yeah. And she gives him a hug and she was like, that's cool, let's go home. And then I was like, good for her. And then at the scene where the parents are yelling at her and he's just sitting there, I was really worried for a moment that she was just gonna try and throw the blame onto him being like, well, I may have an interracial marriage, but he's a gay. I was really, really? worried she was going to do that for some reason, because I feel like I've seen that in shows before. Okay, like, I was oh, gonna I... say, who hurt you? She, she didn't, that seems so <laughs> out of character for her. No, I've seen, I've seen them do that in shows before, and I was like, oh, please don't do that, girl. Please don't do it. And she didn't, she stuck her ground, good for her. And I was like, it's a good sister, I like her. Yeah, like, based on their interaction in episode two, I would have never assumed that she would have turned around like, well, he dated a guy. Like, that would have been, that would have been very out of character for her because she seems like the kind of person that, like, she doesn't base her decisions on how she's been hurt. She bases her decisions on, on her opinion alone. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah. I've seen that happen in shows, and I was like, we've only had one scene with her, so... I mean, I'm glad that you came to that opinion, but we really don't have too much basis for that either because we had the one scene, so it yeah. could have gone either way. I just, I really, 
I think that says more to the way that boys love continues to throw women under the bus. Like we are always the bitch and it's side tangent. I'm watching game boys right now, which I cannot wait to talk about game boys. I'm very much enjoying the show. I hope that Mason enjoys it as well. I'm sure he won't, but I don't care. Cause I just want to talk about it anyway. Uh, in episode eight, uh, we find out that the reason why one of the characters ran away from home is because he was outed by a girl who had a crush on him that he rejected. And he rejected by saying, I'm not sure if I'm into girls. Meaning that he had not even made up his mind about whether or not he's gay or anything else. He's just like, I, I really don't know mm -hmm. that I like girls, so I, I don't want to lead you on. She outs him to his parents and then posts his picture on Facebook saying, ladies beware, this guy likes guys. And it was so hurtful in that moment to see that because there was like, there's a really strong girl character on that show, which is Pearl. And she's just, she's just really nice. I like her a lot. Like they write her character pretty good. But to then have a girl be the villain because the ramifications of what this girl did went past her outing him to his parents. Mm -hmm. it, it it caused a lot of it was a domino effect basically mm -hmm. and I just we're always that it's always like in together with me it's always the ex-girlfriend who knows that her boyfriend is gay but continuously tries to keep him by her side just because she needs the reputation of this popular guy to be hers mm -hmm. it's constantly in other shows where just evil girls and that's the reason why the guys don't want to date girls anymore they decide they're going to try being gay and I'm just really sick of that trope because I mean not to put too fine a point to it me and Mason are friends and mm -hmm. I'm cishet and Mason is you know cis gay and we don't have a friendship that is based on me liking Mason as anything other than a friend you know, mm -hmm. a pseudo family member, but they keep throwing this narrative that guys and girls can only be close if there's a romantic relationship or if the girl is like a saint fantasy woman. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think that's correct. And I don't think it's right. And I just, I really, I just hate that. Also, I can speak to this point. When I was in high school, I had a crush on a guy and he was not super attractive, he wasn't popular, but mm -hmm. I had a crush on him because he was the person who understood me the best. And mm -hmm. we had the best conversations and we had the best, you know, discussions about music and television and we had very similar ideals out of life. And once we graduated high school, um, he went off to join the priesthood, but he ended up leaving because he realized that he was gay. And when I found out he was gay, my response to that was, have you been to the gay and lesbian community center here in town? I'll go with you. Mm -hmm. And that's where our relationship went. And that man was my best friend for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. Robert, I miss you. Uh, but the reaction that I had when I found out that there wasn't any possibility of there being a romantic relationship was not, I need to ruin this man. My reaction was, okay, I still want him in my life. Let me just change, shift some things around, move some emotions around and keep this thing moving. Right. And I just wish that they could show that a little bit more and not this kind of like, well, I can't have you then. I, I want to see you burn because right. I don't feel like that's healthy based on the population that watches these shows. Yes. Because we got a lot of girls grown women watching these shows and to keep having that character there, I think it shows that you don't have faith in your audience, that these are the kind mm -hmm. of people that you assume are watching these shows. Right. And I think they need to, I mean, I think these shows could be like really good teaching moments for how to react if a friend comes out or is dealing with something that's related to being gay, like being kicked out, you know? So they could use female characters as a positive influence, you know? I think there are a few shows that do, but for them, but there are a lot that, like, I guess Game Boys is just like, fucking, man, that sounds tiring. But it also opens up a bigger conversation in, like, the male gay community as well, because a lot of gay males, usually white gay males, we're the problem ones, real talk, um, that are like, oh, there's too many girls at the drag show. 
And it's like, women are often very supportive and tip really well at drag shows and are very polite and kind. And it's like, women have a place being in gay bars if they want to be, you know? Because I feel like there's this weird narrative where there's just like, women are always going to cause trouble in a gay space, and that's often not the case. And it comes from different things. You know, it's, it's a weird relationship that cishet women and gay men have mm -hmm. in that a lot of times with women, our relationship with gay men has almost seemed like a Parasite is not the word I'm looking for, but kind of similar. It's like we all expect somebody, the other person to contribute to our life in some way or to fill some role in some way. So a lot of straight women who are dumb have been like, oh, I wish I had a gay best friend so that they can do A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anybody should want a friend to fulfill a role in their life other yeah. than friendship. I've definitely been on that end. Yeah, like I would never look at Mason and be like, oh, I wish that Mason would just redo my wardrobe. First of all, I don't trust what Mason would do with my wardrobe, so that would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying I have bad taste? I'm saying that I am scared for what you would pick for me. Because mm. I can't go out the house <laughs> looking like Sailor Moon or any other anime character. So. <laughs> And I can't go out the house looking like a K-pop idol either. So that's why I'm saying I, I don't look to him for fashion advice. But like, I don't expect Mason to be doing this number and you go girl or any of that. I expect that when I'm talking to Mason, I'm talking about the things that we mutually enjoy, having a good conversation and just keep it keeping it moving. But there are a lot of straight women that have had that, oh, I expect you to be my stylist and my confidant and give me love advice and, you know, be good for a, mm -hmm. a one, two line or a punch line or two or, or witticisms. And right. that's been perpetrated over and over by the media. Movie or something like, sis, I'm going to have you turned into man bait in no time. And mm -hmm. it's just like, as a black woman, we also fulfill that role in movies. Don't get it twisted. We always are the fat black friend who's like, girl, if your man ain't treating you right, we need to find you a new man, mm -hmm. you know? But in real life, with real people, it gets messy because who wants to be in a friendship where that is who you are? Mm -hmm. Who wants to be in a friendship where your only role in friendship is to be kind of the framing device for somebody else's life? Right. Nobody wants that. And then the same thing with like gay men. Like there's a lot of gay men who love women in pop culture. You know, mm -hmm. it goes way, way back to like Judy Garland and Barbara Streisand and Madonna. Mm -hmm. Like there's always been a big female presence in gay culture. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, it's been uncomfortable too because it sometimes feels like the style of woman or the version of woman that's celebrated in gay culture is a version or a style of woman that doesn't exist in, in the, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, because let's be fair, a lot of the women that find large popularity in gay culture are women whose images a lot of times are curated by gay men. Yep, because usually, so, like a, at least in this day and age, it's like a pop star, you know? It's like yeah, our one day, or Lady Gaga. Who has a gay brother, Lady Gaga, who keeps a very gay team. You know, like a lot of them keep gay creatives in their team when they're producing their product. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like they're subliminally speaking to their audience in the background. Right. But, you know, when it comes to like the averages of the world, I feel like a lot of times we're seen as adversarial in a lot of ways. And mm -hmm. I don't know where that dynamic came from, but it really makes it to where it's very hard for us to kind of just hang out and have relationships that aren't weird. Mm -hmm. And I hate that. I really do. Because like over the years, I've been close to gay men. Like I was just mentioning about Robert. And then of course I'm doing this with Mason and, you know, I've never seen those relationships be any of the things that the media said these relationships are supposed to be or any of the negative things that have been kind of passed around as the trope for the community and to see it 
rearing its ugly head in Thai boys love or Japanese boys love or Filipino boys love. It just, it's setting things back. Cause I feel mm -hmm. like we're moving past that point now. Right, right. Tangent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this show is tangent the show. Right. I mean, honestly, it should be, you know, tangent the series. <laughs> but ratings times. I feel very comfortable giving this show an eight and a half. I, I don't want to give it a nine because I think you know who I reserve my nine for, but I would definitely give it an eight and a half. I want to be a little different. I'm going to go 8.75. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost when, there. <laughs> you bring up the point. Yeah, I mean, definitely the, the biggest drawbacks to it getting a better rating is things left unsaid, length of series. Um, those are the things, basically. It, yeah. We wish the show was longer. We wish there were more scenes that were shown. We wish there were more things that were said. I'd like to see it run through the entire length of the manga. But outside of that, I think they had really good action. Oh, and, and of course, the hair. Like, yeah. if you could do it, you could do it with that fucking hair. But other than that, I think this was a really good show, and I highly recommend it to anybody who's looking for a quick, fast, dirty watch, because it is, it is great. It is really, mm. really great. So, do you have an Instagram of the week today? I do. Uh, my Instagram of the week is blupdate2020. So, it's B like boy, L like love, update 2020 like this godforsaken year. And this is an Instagram that basically updates you on what are the latest series coming out all over Asia for Boys Love. And I think that that's an important Instagram for people to follow because a lot of times we don't know what shows are airing and where they are airing. And this yeah. Instagram does do a good job of saying whether or not it's something that's going to be available internationally or if it's not. Mm -hmm. And while we are on that fucking tangent. Hong Kong? <sighs> oh, man. You know what? Some people just have bad marketing tactics, and this is one of them. This is a bad marketing tactic, but okay. It is a trend. I keep seeing more and more new boy loves that are not going to be available internationally, and I can only think that the problem is that they either don't want to pay for the interpreters so they can do the captions, or they don't want to be exposed to criticism because there's really ugly tropes that they plan on using that maybe they feel like the home audience wouldn't have a problem with. That's the mm -hmm. only thing I could think is the reason why they're not making these things ready internationally. But like, to this day, I still don't understand why GMMTV does not make He's Coming to Me available to an international audience. I don't know either. Ugh. That show's not problematic. That show's not bad. It's... Mm -hmm. It's a great fucking show, and mm -hmm. it should be seen by many boys love audiences, but it's not available internationally. Um, speaking of another show for GMMTV, uh, they have a show called, I think it's called I'm, the, I'm T, You're T, something like that, and it's got um, Chris Singto, Off and Gun, and Nu and Tay, which are like the three huge GMM boys love couples. And they're in this show where they all live in a house and everyone's nickname has some version of the name Tay in it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's necessarily a boy's love. I think it's just like some fan servicey thing or whatever. I still would like to see it. And mm -hmm. I won't be able to because it will not be played internationally. It's part of GMMTV's IES play, some, some other bullshit thing that I have no access to. Right. And I don't understand why a network who has fully acknowledged that these are some of the most popular actors employed under them having a series, why wouldn't they make this available internationally? Because mm -hmm. they make but, money off of the international audience, even just having the YouTube views, you know? Oh, absolutely. Oh my God, if he's coming to me was on YouTube, it would be in the millions per, per part, you know? Absolutely. Like, you know, not to be that guy, but <laughs> Om and Sing Tu are probably some of the most charismatic actors that GMMTV currently employs. Mm -hmm. And they are dripping, oozing, leaking charisma throughout this entire show. Right. 
So I really, really feel like this would have been, this would have been something that would have had a very strong audience. But like, I watched um, Ty BL do a count, not a countdown, but like my top boys love shows for 2019, 2020. They didn't even mention he's coming to me. Didn't even mention it. Because, because it's not there. You can't tell me Theory Theory of Love is better. No, no, that doesn't sit right with me. (laughs) <laughs> and theory of love don't get me wrong there are some good parts of theory of love especially like the b couple in theory of love i would like to see a whole series with those two i feel like there's more to flesh out that story but theory of love also got really tiring at a certain point yeah episodes yeah. one and two you're like i'm okay with this but mm-hmm. episode six you're like <sighs> yeah just kill him already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a show I'd like to see. <laughs> but yeah, like he's coming to me never has that lag. It stays mm-hmm. interesting from the very first moment to the very last moment. The only part that's like somewhat troubling is the fact that uh, he meets the, one of the main characters meets the other main character when he is a small boy. Yeah. That's the only part that you're like, eh, that way. but other than that, like, for the most part, the show is pretty faultless, and mm-hmm. it has a really great coming out scene. And it's just a shame that more people won't get to see that because these companies are being fucking assholes. And Studio Wabi Sabi, I'm extremely surprised with their decision not to put Long Con. Is Long Con? Is it that was called Long I Con? Think so. But is is it Wabi Sabi? Yes, it is Wabi Sabi because it's um, Boon Prem are Wabi Sabi actors, and they are in this. But I guess I didn't, but there's actors not from Wabi Sabi in it. So I'm just saying, I don't know if it's Wabi Sabi that's making it. No, it's Wabi Sabi. That's the reason why I tweeted, like, you know, it's really short-sighted for the studio not to make this internationally available. Hmm. Yeah, but it's Studio Wabi Sabi, and it is a series that's like a, it's like a horror. Love mechanics is worthy of an international audience, but not this. Thank you. I what they want. So we've been really lucky in that we did a savage review of two of the End of Love series, and somehow or another, people still wanted to watch our asses. Mm-hmm. But the shows are awful. They're absolutely oh. awful. And the fact that those shows are promoted and subs are given in real time and they're put on the channel every week but this which people have been talking about since the very first trailer came out Mm -hmm. is not subbed is not being broadcast internationally i don't get the logic and especially with until we meet again that b couple being as insanely popular as they are and them having like steamy skin should be seen in the movie Mm -hmm. but you're not going to put it international. I don't get it. I just, I don't understand how this makes any sense money wise or any otherwise. Mm -hmm. I really want to see it because it seems like a cool, like horror show. And then you get the skinship with Prembone and I'm like, yes, give me, give it to me. Yeah. It very much feels like a dark comedy kind of like, yeah, like a dark comedy kind of type of thing. And, and then Boon Prem. <coughs> it reminds me of Tomie, and I love that. <laughs> I was thinking, for some reason, I was thinking Jennifer's Body or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie. Yeah. Man, so, Jennifer's Body is underrated, but different yeah. question. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Boys Love, or BL Update 2020, or 2020, Check out their Instagram so you can figure out more stuff that's going to be available to you. And they do pretty much all the major Asian countries that are producing voice of content. So you're getting Vietnam, Philippines, Korea, Japan, Thailand. So it's Mm -hmm. a lot of information. They update daily. So it's a really good Instagram to check out. Mm -hmm. Do you have a manga of the day? I do. I have one of my favorites. It's so cute. It's called Deco Boco Sugar Days. Here's the cover. It's super cute. Here's the back cover. It is mature. I will say that, but it's only one scene. And overall, it's a very, um, it's just fluffy. Like reading it out, I, if I like am having trouble going to bed and if, 
one of the things I, I found out is like, oh, if you are having trouble, like, like your mind is wandering as you're trying to sleep and you can't sleep, it's good to read something. This is one of the things I always pick up to read because it's just so fucking, it's just so fucking sweet. And it always brings a smile to my face. It's about these two high I'll just read the back. So, Yujiro Matsukaze has been close friends with Rui Hanamine since the two of them were children. Back then, Yujiro was the one who stood up for and took care of his adorable, soft-hearted friend. But as it turns out, Yujiro's childhood friend, Dream... I forgot how to read. I am so sorry. This is, I, I was <laughs> always what? bad at like reading classes, always like, I'm sh what if I mess up? I messed up, oh my God. But as it turns out, Yujiro's childhood dreams end up, end up growing up a little too big to handle, or rather too tall. Oh, that's just a really phrase sentence, that's why. It basically, he's the main character. He's kind of like, he's very loyal, but he's a little bit, he kind of has like resting bitch face and it's just kind of like, a little bit grumpier. And then he always wanted to protect his childhood friend. But his childhood friend is like this very soft, cuddly boy, but he's six feet tall. And Yujiro's like five four. And he's like, oh, so it's like an interesting height dynamic that you normally don't see. Because usually like, you know, the top is taller and more masculine. And it's usually the other way around. But it's like, the tall one is like the feminine, you know, uh, I don't know. It was, it's, it's a good dynamic. Um, it's, it's very cute. There's not a lot of fuss with, there's no like weird consensual issues. There's nothing super problematic about it. Good, good manga, good characters. I like them a lot. Super funny. I love the drawings. Um, let me find a good page. I don't know. Okay, here. Like these drawings I just think are really good. Um, they're very pretty. I like staring at them. This is so cute. It's so cute. Yeah, sorry. I'm going off. That's very good. It's by Atsuko Yusen. I don't know if this person has other works. This is published by Tokyo Pop. And I got it at Kinokuniya in Los Angeles. Well, it sounds like a good time. Um, mm -hmm. I always enjoy height different stories and it's always nice to flip the trope around to where it's not the big guy, it's the small guy who's the sundere. So it's always a good time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, today's episode was actually pretty good length. I'm surprised. I think a lot of it is because we spent about 30 minutes in Tangent Bill, but you know mm -hmm. what? That's what you came here for. This is what you <laughs> did not pay for. So <laughs> enjoy. Next week's uh, watch. I'm going to let Mason say because I actually have no familiarity with this title at all, so this will be a surprise to me as well as possibly to you guys. So this is, um, I actually haven't seen it yet, but I've read the manga. It is called I Can Hear the Sunspots, but it's probably easier if you type in the Japanese, which is Hidamari ga Kikoeru, which I'll put in the comments or in the description so you can find that one easier. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's a movie it's about one hour it's based off of a manga and it's a boys love it's a boys love manga that i really like it's actually the first boys love manga that i ever read i started a couple years ago in college and it's still updating the only problem with boys love in japan is the updates come super infrequently so like i could wait six months for a chapter you know so i check it literally once a year now because i'm like just to see if there's a chapter <laughs> because you know, making boys love doesn't make a whole lot of money in Japan if you're a mangaka, so it doesn't update that often, but the movie, I believe, is a complete story. It takes, like, the first arc of the manga. Oh my god. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened either. It says we're still recording. That's what it said, and that's what I was like, I don't know. I don't know if my internet cut out or if Mason's internet cut out. I'm not I think, sure. I think it was mine. Okay, well, we should wrap this up. I'm so sorry for the black screen you guys might have watching. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I wish I could edit and, like, do better. Oh. You know, it, it, it's real. Before we go, um, so if you'll say the title one more time, and then I think, hopefully, depending on your work schedule, the episode after next week's will be Game Boys. Yes, should be. Okay. Yeah, so what's yeah. next week's again? It's called Hidamari Ga Kikoeru, um, or I Can Hear the Sunspots. 
Okay. So right, well, I'm so sorry for the internet troubles. Oh, I don't okay. know why that happened. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. It really is okay. Okay. Well, all right. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>